Welcome, 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 everyone. Good to see you. This evening, we commemorate the centenary of the ascension of Abdu'l-Baha with the fourth of our PG town hall meetings. We have a wonderful program of stories, writing, prayers, and songs, and we welcome you to share yours with us. This November, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the passing of Abdu'l-Baha. The Universal House of Justice has given us a bounteous glimmering of their planning. Our team has been consulting about local efforts that can help us prepare day by day for that anniversary. Each of us can make a personal commitment to learn more about Abdu'l-Baha. We can practice telling favorite stories about Abdu'l-Baha's life and then share them with friends. We can incorporate stories and writings of Abdu'l-Baha into our core activities. We can invite friends to town hall style gatherings where participants share writings and life stories of Abdu'l-Baha. Tonight, we will open with a prepared program of stories and writing from Abdu'l-Baha's arrival in Akka in 1868 to the passing of Baha'u'llah in 1892. Attendees are then invited to share stories and quotes. They can be from other years and other authors, but should help us better understand Abdu'l-Baha. Praise be to thee, O Lord, my God. Thou seest and knowest that I have called upon thy servant to turn nowhere except in the direction of thy bestowers, and I have bidden them observe not save the things thou didst prescribe in thy perspicuous book, the book which had been sent down according to thine inscrutable decree and irrevocable purpose. I can utter no word, O oh my God, unless I be permitted by thee and can move in no direction until I obtain thy sanction. It is thou, O oh my God, who hath called me into being through the power of thy might and hast endured me with thy grace to manifest thy cause. Therefore, I have been subjected to such adversities that may tongue had been hindered from extolling thee and from magnifying thy glory. All praise be to thee, O oh my God, for the things thou didst ordain for me through thy decree and by the power of thy sovereignty, I beseech thee that thou wilt fortify both myself and them that love me in our love for thee and will it keep us firm in thy cause. I swear by thy might, O oh my God, thy servant's shame is to be shut out as by a veil from thee, and his glory is to know thee. Armed with the power of thy name, nothing can ever hurt me, and with thy love in my heart, all the wars afflictions can in no wise alarm me. Send down therefore, O oh my Lord, open me and open my loved ones, that which will protect us from the mischief of those that have repudiated thy truth and disbelieved in thy signs. Thou art verily the all glorious, the most wonderful, Abdu'l-Baha. 
to, to begin with, we're going to look at what was going on in the United States in the years 1868 to 1892, especially relating to people of African heritage. And then we'll go to Abdu'l-Bahá in the Ottoman Empire. Even after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, four years of civil war, service by African-American troops, and the defeat of the Confederacy, the nation was still unprepared to deal with the question of full citizenship for its newly freed Black population. The Reconstruction implemented by Congress, which lasted from 1866 to 1877, was aimed at reorganizing the Southern states after the Civil War, providing the means for readmitting them into the Union and redefining the means by which whites and blacks could live together in a non-slave society. The South, however, saw reconstruction as a humiliating, even vengeful imposition and did not welcome it. During the years after the war, black and white teachers from the North and South, missionary organizations, churches and schools worked tirelessly to give the emancipated population the opportunity to learn. Former slaves of every age took advantage of the opportunity to become literate. Grandfathers and their grandchildren sat together in classrooms seeking to obtain the tools of freedom. On the right, you see the three amendments to the US Constitution that were passed in the space of five years after the end of the Civil War. 13th Amendment, outlawing slavery. 14th Amendment, granting citizenship to any person born or neutralized in the US. And the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing Black American men the right to vote. With the protection of these amendments to the Constitution and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, African Americans enjoyed a period when they were allowed to vote, actively participate in the political process, acquire the land of former owners, seek their own employment, and use public accommodations. Opponents of this progress, however, soon rallied against the former slaves' freedom and began to find means for eroding the gains for which many had shed their blood. So we have some examples by year, 1869, Tennessee had a biracial state government, but in that year they replaced it with an all white government and other states followed suit. 1871, in the US House of Representatives, there were five black members. That was a peak. 1875, a gentleman named Bruce from Mississippi begins a full six year term. He's an African American, he's the only African-American to be in the Senate for the full six years in that time. And it never happens again until 100 years later in 1969. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 guarantees equal rights to African-Americans in public accommodations and jury duty, but eight years later is ruled unconstitutional. 1877, we see the end of Reconstruction. And it happened in this way. The presidential election was very close. It was disputed and it was resolved with a deal and the deal involved ending reconstruction. So the South won that. 1888, two of America's first black owned banks opened, one in Richmond, one in Washington, DC. Why was that? Well, that community was trying to look after itself. And in 1890, the Mississippi plan using literacy and understanding tests to disenfranchise black American citizens from voting and other states adopted that method. On the right, see a count by year of known lynchings of black Americans in the US. I'm showing from 1882 to 1898, clearly they happened before that and after that. Meanwhile, in the Ottoman Empire, 
The empire was just at the beginning of a sharp decline. The territories that were Ottoman land at that time, that the family of Abdul Baha arrived in Akka, are here in orange and pink. When they arrived in 1868, which is just at the end of the reign of Abdul Aziz, the Sultan to whom Baha'u'llah had previously sent a letter when he wrote to the kings and rulers of the world in what is called the proclamation of Baha'u'llah. When he was in Adrianople, that same Sultan, Baha'u'llah again wrote to him when they arrived in Akka and asked him why they were being treated the way they were being treated and warned him again against corruption and called upon him to uphold justice for his subjects, as well as for Baha'u'llah and his family and the believers who were innocent and were being prevented from having even food and drink when they arrived in Akka and were being treated like enemies of the state. To the right, you see Prince Abdul Hamid. That's exactly what it looked like at the time that Baha'u'llah had arrived, Abdul Baha had arrived in Akka. This man came to power when he was quite young, in 1876, Abdul Hamid II, he's, I believe, a grandson of Abdul Aziz. He promises to make great reforms. The young Ottomans, a group of reformers who wanted a constitutional monarchy in the Ottoman Empire, had a lot of hope in him. One of his first acts when he came to power was to sign the constitution, the very first constitution of the Ottoman Empire. So this was actually um, after his whole childhood and youth being spent at a time of great reform already taking place in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was much bigger at its height. All of these lands that have any color belonged to the Ottoman Empire. Their border in red, so all the way to Algeria in African continent, and as far west as Vienna, as far south as the bottom of Cairo and some of the Arabian Peninsula, they basically had swallowed up a lot of Eastern Europe. During the reign of Abdul Hamid II, much of that land was lost in the orange. Abdul Hamid, only three years after signing that constitution, revoked it. He dissolved the constitution as well as the parliament that it protected because of disagreements with the parliament. He ended up continuing to reform a lot of things. He extended two railways, major railways across the empire and built two new ones. He established a lot of professional schools, I believe the first law school and the empire. He had closed the University of Constantinople, and he reopened it. It was renovated. He established a census and registered the citizens, and he also improved the telegraph system. And he did a great deal for education in the country, established primary and secondary schools, as well as military schools. All the while, he strengthened his awareness of what the people were doing because there were so many small uprisings throughout the country, and he had to clamp down on them. Sometimes those uprisings got help from Russia and others and became full-blown battles. And during one of the clamp downs of some of the people, he earned the name the Red Sultan, which lost him the allies in Europe, the alliances he had with Europe. So he lost a war with Russia. Later, he won a war with Greece. But his rule, known as the Hamidian period, ended up losing the most territory that the Ottoman Empire ever had. He also married a lot of women during this time as well. This is a photo on the left of Akka, I think 1840 or around that period that Baha'u'llah had arrived, maybe the 18, late 1800s. Um, the prison cell where Baha'u'llah lived is the last window on the far right. He stayed in that prison from 1868 to 1870. When they were exiled there, 
they had no access to water for days, no food, their life was in peril. But as the autumn grew colder, the conditions of the city made it difficult for people, especially those who were living on the damp earth of the prison cells. Akka was not very well developed at the time, even though it's among the oldest continually inhabited settlements on earth from the Middle Bronze Age, 1,600 years before Christ was that first settlement. It had also gone a period where there was nobody there. They kind of abandoned it for a thousand years and then people resettled. It has been conquered and destroyed several times over. And during the Crusades, the Crusaders used it as a fort. And if you look at the map on the right, you see that Akka has a huge thick wall that goes all the way around the city. It keeps people out. And of course, in the time of Baha'u'llah, it really served to also keep people in. Between the blocks of buildings, there are very narrow alleys. And those narrow alleys, for anyone who's traveled to this part of the world, they're kind of scary to walk in. There's no real light. There's no trees in these alleys. It's just buildings on either side of you all the way down until the next alley. So it's like a maze of alleys. Even though they're surrounded by water all the way around the wall on three sides, you can't really see the water very clearly from inside the city. So it's very dismal. Another aerial view of the city and its, its current state, and then an older photo in the middle, and then one of those alleyways. One of the things that Abdu'l-Bahá describes about the city is that in those trees inside the walls of the city, on their branches, as well as up in the battlements, the owls would cry all night long. There's a tradition that says, so foul was the air of the city. When Baha'u'llah described that, would a bird pass over it, it would fall dead because of the air. Baha'u'llah's description here is the, it was the most desolate of the cities of the world the most unsightly of them in appearance, the most detestable in climate, and the foulest in water. In fact, there was no water source inside the city, and there was no sanitation to speak of. So disease was rampant, and a lot of the people who were in that prison, especially the people who had recently come as exiles with Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá and his family, fell ill. And Abdu'l-Bahá and two of the others who had not gotten sick, one of them was his uncle, and another one was one of the other believers. And Abdu'l-Bahá and these two men nursed the others back to health. There was no medicine allowed to come in. They weren't able to get to a doctor, and no doctor was allowed in a prison. They suffered from fevers, malaria, dysentery, and Abdullah would look at any provisions that came in and he would throw away any food that was harmful. And he kept everyone on a diet of a simple broth and boiled rice. You can understand why boiling the rice would be very important in that time. And actually nine of the 10 guards had fallen ill as well. And Abdullah himself, as Bahia Khanum remembers in this quote, was utterly exhausted and fell sick along with his mother and three others who had been well before. The others recovered, but she says Abbas Effendi, who's Abdu'l-Bahá, was taken with dysentery and he long remained in a dangerous condition. By his heroic exertions, he had won the regard of one of the officers. And when this man saw my brother, she said, in the state, he went to the governor and pleaded that Abbas Effendi might have a physician. This was permitted, and under the care of the physician, my brother recovered. This official was not the only person who had recognized Abdu'l-Bahá's heroism, his nobility, his kindness, and his compassion. So many people around the city, as he continued to go and care for people, recognized his character. Baha'u'llah, in their time in Akka, assigned to Abdu'l-Bahá, the task of ministering to the people so that Baha'u'llah could focus on writing counsels for the people of the future. This is a memory of Bahia Khanum. 
she says that her father's instructions to Abdul Baha were, now I concentrate on my work of writing commands and counsels for the world of the future. To thee, I leave the province of talking with and ministering to the people. Service is the essence of worship. I have finished with the outer world. Henceforth, I meet only the disciples. And so it was that Abdul Baha had this special charge. He had to stand his ground in front of the callous jailers, the brutal guards, the hostile officials, and he never wavered. So some of the people he was able to win over. And one of those people is Sheikh Mahmoud. His story is quite a fascinating one. These symbols will be explained as we go through the story. He progresses from being an enemy of Baha'u'llah to being a servant of Baha'u'llah. When he was a young boy, about 10 years old, a friend of his father's, who was a revered clergyman, had a dream. And in this dream, he was told that the promised one would be coming, but that he and his father would not live to see that day. But he assured Mahmoud that when he grew up, he would see him, and he said to watch out for him. Al-Baha had won some freedom because of his behaviors and was allowed to go to the market and go into the square in Akka. Sheikh Mahmoud, who now was a young adult, was one of the leading clerics of the city. He had believed all of the terrible calumnies that had been spread about the exiles that had been sent to Akka, and he was very perturbed to see al-Baha in the mosque. And he reportedly grabbed al-Baha and exclaimed, Are you the son of God? And the master, with his characteristic charm, pointed out that it was he who was saying that, not al-Baha. And then he reminded him of the injunction of Islam to be charitable toward the guests, even if he be an infidel. His attitude toward al-Baha was, as a result, softened. Despite that, he still felt that the presence of these individuals was just ungodly. And he said, the best course of action is to assassinate Baha'u'llah. He made two attempts to do this. He came to the prison and he asked to see Baha'u'llah and in his cloak he had hidden a knife. So when the messenger went to see Baha'u'llah and asked if Sheikh Mahmoud could visit him, he came back and said, no, not while you have a weapon on your person. Now, how could Baha'u'llah know he had a weapon? Nobody could see it. And so perturbed, he left. But he was still committed to this act. And so he came back another day and said to himself, I don't need a weapon. I can just go and strangle him. I mean, I, I can just use my hands. But we have to get rid of this terrible presence among us. And so he asked again to visit Baha'u'llah. The message came back this time. When his heart was pure, he could then come to visit. Again, he totally flustered. He left and he had a dream. And this dream was reminiscent of the one his father's friend, the cleric, from his youth had had. Not knowing what else to do, he went to Abdul Baha and asked him about it because he still had reverence for Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha spent some time with him and brought him to Baha'u'llah. As soon as he entered Baha'u'llah's presence, he was completely overwhelmed. He fell to his knees, kissed his feet, and from that point forward, he became a loyal servant. He has a part in the story of Mirza Mahdi, which is the next section that we're going to talk about. In that, he was so dedicated to Baha'u'llah for the rest of his life. This transforming action was made possible through the intersection of Abdu Baha with this one key cleric in Akka. The story of Mirza Mahdi, an amazing story. There are aspects of Mirza Mahdi's sacrifice that go well beyond merely the events that are generally known. In Akka, Mirza Mahdi lived in the barracks near his father, and often he would serve as Baha'u'llah's secretary. On June 22nd in 1870, early in the evening, he was informed that he wasn't needed that day, and that instead he could go up on the roof for prayer, which was something he often did. Many of the prisoners would do that for fresh air in the hot of the summer. He had often paced up and down chanting prayers and meditating. But on that fateful evening, as he chanted the verses of the Kasidi-i-Vakari, which means the Ode of the Dove, 
one of Baha'u'llah's most moving poems revealed in Kurdistan. He was carried away in a state of utter detachment and joy. Now, he was very familiar with this area. He had done this many times. He knew where the skylight was. And yet, on this particular evening, he was so taken by these words in this meditation that he stepped badly and fell through the skylight and was badly wounded. It was so bad that they had to remove his clothes and, and everything. This is just a brief, unofficial translation of a portion of this piece. It was written at the request of the divines in Suleimanie as kind of a test of Baha'u'llah's spiritual capacity, if you will, because he was asked to write it in a certain style that no one else had been able to do. So I'll just read a few stanzas from it. This is an ode around the visitation of the maid of heaven who appeared to Baha'u'llah when he was in the Seychelles. He is the exalted, the all-glorious. They have enraptured me, rays of light from a face at whose revelation all suns have hidden themselves. As if rays of the sun had appeared from the radiance of her beauty, appeared in all the worlds and dazzled them. The musk of the cloud of unknowing were stirred up by her joy. The spirit of exaltation was raised on high by her exaltedness. The trumpet of resurrection gave forth a blast as she blew into it. Her perfume caused the shadow of the clouds to move away. The Sinai of eternity was made manifest through her shining. By her glory, the light of splendor was revealed. To the west of her, the sun of manifestation appeared. To the east, the moon of moons was made new once more. From her tresses, the perfume of the left breathes forth. From her glances, the eye of beauty was consoled. The face of guidance was shown the way by the light of her face. And the soul of the speaker of Moses was purified by the fire of her countenance. So that's just a flavor of the beauty of this writing. And you can see how it would have enraptured his soul to be chanting this at that time. This is taken from a diary of one of the people who was there when Mirza Medi was found. He was carried uh, to his room and the doctor was called, but there was not much he could do. Mirza Medi was in much pain and agony and very weak, but he warmly greeted those who came to his bedside, showered an abundance of love and favors upon them, and apologized to everyone, saying he was ashamed that while they were all sitting, he had to lie down in their presence. I mean, it's just such humility. Baha'u'llah came to him, and in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, uh, Tahir Zadeh takes a moment to talk about what that relationship was like, what it could have been like for Baha'u'llah to come to him. And he says, it must be remembered that the relationship of Baha'u'llah and the members of his family who remained faithful to the cause was not identical to the relationship that exists between members of other families. Normally, a father and son are close and they're informal. But in the case of Baha'u'llah and his faithful children, it was very different. Although that intimate relationship of father and son did exist. However, the station of Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God completely overshadowed his position as a physical father. Abdu Baha, the greatest holy leaf and the purest branch, looked upon Baha'u'llah not merely as their father, but as their Lord. And because they had truly recognized his station, they acted at all times as most humble servants at his threshold. As Baha always entered the presence of Baha'u'llah with such genuine humbleness and reverence that no one among his followers could manifest the spirit of lowliness and utter self-effacement as he did. The humility of al Baha as he bowed before his father, or prostrated himself at his feet, or dismounted his steed when he approached the mansion in which Baha'u'llah resided, demonstrated this unique relationship which existed between this father and his faithful sons and daughter. In light of this, we can just imagine and appreciate how the purest branch must have felt when Baha'u'llah went to his side. What expressions of devotion, love, and thanksgiving must have passed through his lips on that occasion, we cannot imagine. 
because Baha'u'llah was alone with Mirza Mahdi during this time. All we know is that Baha'u'llah, having the power of life and death in his hands, asked his dying son whether he wished to live. He assured him that if this was his wish, God would enable him to recover and grant him good health. But the purest branch begged Baha'u'llah to accept his life as a ransom for the opening of the gates of the prison to the face of the many believers who were longing to come and enter the presence of their Lord. Baha'u'llah accepted his sacrifice and he died on 23 June 1870, about 22 hours after his fall. And after this happened, of course, the friends were able to visit Baha'u'llah and shortly thereafter he was able to leave the actual prison itself and move out into a house in the city. But there's more to this than just that sacrifice and the creation of greater access to Baha'u'llah that resulted. Because the death of the purest branch, and this is you know from Shoghi Effendi, must be viewed as Baha'u'llah's own sacrifice. This is incredible to me. A sacrifice on the same level as the crucifixion of Christ and the martyrdom of the Bab. Shoghi Effendi states that Baha'u'llah has exalted the death of the purest branch to the rank of those great acts of atonement associated with Abraham's intended sacrifice of his son, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein. In another instance, Shoghi Effendi states, in the Babi dispensation, it was the Bab himself who sacrificed his life for the redemption and purification of mankind. In the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, it was the purest branch who gave his life, releasing thereby all the forces necessary for bringing about the unity of mankind. Take a minute and think about that. Just incredible. Being the sacrifice of Baha'u'llah himself, the purest branch, by offering his life as a ransom for the opening of the gates of the prison, released incalculable spiritual energies within human society. Energies which in the fullness of time will bring about the unity of the human race. And a prayer revealed by Baha'u'llah on the day that the purest branch died. Baha'u'llah has made the following statement, which Shoghi Effendi described as astounding. Glorified art thou, Lord my God. Thou seest me in the hands of mine enemies and my son bloodstained before thy face. O thou in whose hands is the kingdom of all names, I have, O my Lord, offered up that which thou hast given me, that my servants may be quickened, and all that dwell on earth be united. The mystery of the sacrifice of Mirza Mahdi, I think we're just beginning to learn about and understand, and I, I would imagine that you know there would be more writings on, on this event in, in, in the future. There were earthquakes associated with this as well, and, and there's a, a reference in, in the uh, revelation of Baha'u'llah to the fact that Baha'u'llah does indeed confirm that earthquakes in the area were attributable to his passing. Now, the story of Sheikh Mahmoud is also here as well because he insisted to Abdu'l Baha, Sheikh Mahmoud did, that he be allowed to prepare the body of Mirza Mahdi for burial because he did not want anyone else, any of the guards, any non-believer to, to touch him. So complete was his transformation from being a, an avowed enemy to being a defender and protector of the faith through his interaction with Al-Baha and Baha'u'llah. So every time I read through this, I'm astounded by the full import and impact of this event. Munira Hanum was the daughter of two of the earlier followers of the Bab. Her father's name was Mirza Muhammad Ali Nari, and he was a member of a prominent family in Isfahan. A story that was recalled is one night a number of people were invited to dine with the Bab, and Mirza Muhammad was one of the guests. The Bab asked him if he had any children, 
And upon hearing that although married twice, he had remained childless, the Bab offered a spoon of his own sweet to Mirza Muhammad Ali, who ate some and kept the rest for his wife. No longer after, she found herself with a child. The daughter who was born to them was Munira Khanum. In early 1872, Bahá'u'lláh sent Sheikh Salman, his carrier, to Islamabad with the instruction to escort Munira Khanum and her brother, Said Yihye, to Akko. I was beside myself with joy, Munira Khanum later recalled, that I should, whilst I live, see my Lord, even though the journey should be full of difficulties and danger, and of suffering and uncountable risks. None of these considerations weighed anything in the balance against the gladness of starting on a pilgrimage with my face steadfastly set towards the present of the Holy One. When Munira Hanum first attained the present of Baha'u'llah, his first words to her were, we brought you into the prison city at a time when the prison gate were closed in face of all to make clear and evident to all the power of God. Munir Hanum recounted, many beautiful daughters were offered from time to time by parents anxious that their child should have the honor of becoming the wife of the master. He refused to consider any of them until I arrived. We met each other once and our marriage was arranged. However, the marriage was delayed because there was not enough room available in the little house where Munira and her brother stayed. The landlord of the little house and of the larger one next to it had become devoted to the master. One day he asked to be received by Baha'u'llah to whom he said, well, for the, the delay in the marriage, being told the reason, he exclaimed, I can arrange about the room. I pray thee, let me have the honor of preparing a place for the master and his bride. He hasted to have the door open through into the extra room, which he furnished simply and comfortably. The wedding took place shortly after. Before his wedding day, Abdul Baha made the necessary arrangement for the few guests. His mother and sister made a delicate bridal dress of white batiste. A white headdress adorned Munir Hanum hair, worn as usual in two braids. At nine in the evening, she went with the greatest holy leaf into the presence of Baha'u'llah, who gave her his blessing. She then went to the bridal room and awaiting the, the coming of Abdul Baha. The service was very simple. At about 10 o'clock, Abdul Baha came, accompanied with the guests. Munir Hanum chanted a tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah. Later, the wife of Abud recalled that the sweetness of the chanting is still ringing in her ears. Munir Hanum recounted. At the wedding, there were no cake, only cups of tea. There were no decoration and no choir, but the blessing of Jamal Mubarak. The glory and the beauty of love and happiness were beyond and above all luxury and ceremony. For 50 years, my beloved and I were together. Never were we separated, save during his visits to Egypt, Europe, and America. Abdul Baha and Munir Hunam continued to live in the house of Udi Hamer, the little house, immediately behind the house of Abud. In that house, nine children were born to them, two sons and seven daughters. One son and two daughters died in infancy. A daughter died at 15, and in 1888, another son, Hussein, died when only four years old. This small boy, an eager and active child, was greatly loved by Baha'u'llah. He spent long intervals at Baji where Baha'u'llah delighted in taking him for short walks. The year is 
1877. Baha'u'llah has been in Akka for nine years. Over that time, the governors have shown more and more respect toward him and Abdu'l Baha. One governor going so far as to suggest that Baha'u'llah could leave the prison city and live outside anytime he chose. The next couple paragraphs are quotes from Abdu'l Baha about how that took place. Baha'u'llah loved the beauty and verdure of the country. One day he passed the remark, I have not gazed on verdure, which is greenery, for nine years. The country is the world of the soul. The city is the world of bodies. And Abdu'l Baha says, when I heard indirectly of this saying, I realized that he was longing for the country. And I was sure that whatever I could do towards the carrying out of his wish would be successful. There was in Akka at that time a man called Muhammad Pasha Safwat, who was very much opposed to us. He had a palace called Mazra'i, about four miles north of the city, a lovely place surrounded by gardens and with a stream of running water. I went and called on this Pasha at his home. I said, Pasha, you have left the palace empty and are living in Akka. He replied, I am an invalid and cannot leave the city. If I go there, it is lonely and I am cut off from my friends. I said, while you are not living there and the place is empty, let it to us. He was amazed at the proposal, but soon consented. I got the house at a very low rent, about five pounds per annum, paid him for five years and made a contract. The map in the lower right shows Mazra'i, five miles north of Akka, and an early photograph of the back of Mazra'i. Abdu'l Baha says, I sent laborers to repair the place and put the garden in order and had a bath built. I also had a carriage prepared for the use of the Blessed Beauty. One day, I determined to go and see the place for myself, notwithstanding the repeated injunctions given in successive firmans, which means edicts, that we were on no account to pass the limits of the city walls, I walked out through the city gate. Gendarmes were on guard, but they made no objection. So I proceeded straight to the palace. The next day, I again went out with some friends and officials, unmolested and unopposed, although the guards and sentinels stood on both sides of the city gates. Another day, I arranged a banquet spread a table under the pine trees of Baji and gathered round it the notables and officials of the town. In the evening, we all returned to the town together. So this is Abdu'l Baha leaving Akka for the first time. In the lower left, a photograph of Mazra'i showing its environs, and on the right, two photographs of the inside of the mansion. Abdu'l Baha continues, one day I went to the holy presence of the blessed beauty and said, the palace at Mazra'i is ready for you and a carriage to drive you there. At that time, there were no carriages in Akka or Haifa. He refused to go saying, I am a prisoner. Later, I requested him again, but got the same answer. I went so far as to ask him a third time, but he still said no, and I did not dare to insist further. There was, however, in Akka, a certain Mohammedan sheikh, a well-known man with considerable influence who loved Baha'u'llah and was greatly favored by him. I called the sheikh and explained the position to him. I said, you are daring. Go tonight to his holy presence. Fall on your knees before him. Take hold of his hands and do not let go until he promises to leave the city. Abdul Baha concludes, the Mohammedan Sheikh went directly to Baha'u'llah and sat down close to his knees. He took hold of the hands of the Blessed Beauty and kissed them and asked, why do you not leave the city? He said, I am a prisoner. The Sheikh replied, God forbid, who has the power to make you a prisoner? You have kept yourself in prison. It was your own will to be imprisoned. And now I beg you to come out and go to the palace. It is beautiful and verdant. The trees are lovely and the oranges like balls of fire. As often as the Blessed Beauty said, I am a prisoner, it cannot be. The Sheikh took his hands and kissed them. For a whole hour, he kept on pleading. At last, Baha'u'llah said, Hayalihu, very good. And the Sheikh's patience and persistence were rewarded. 
in spite of the strict firman of Abdul Aziz, which prohibited my meeting or having any intercourse with the blessed perfection, I took the carriage the next day and drove with him to the palace. No one made any objection. I left him there and returned myself to the city. So here we see Abdul Baha working to get Baha'u'llah to see some verdure and enjoy his life after his banishment and imprisonment and the loss of Mirza Midi. For the next 15 years, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha lived apart. They were in two different locations. Baha'u'llah was in Masra and later at Baji. And then Abdul Baha and Munir Hanun, his wife, were still in Akka at the house of Abu. This separation occurred for two reasons. First, by living in Akka, Abdul Baha could best serve as a shield to His Holiness Baha'u'llah, his physical father, bearing the burden of meeting with government officials and others thus assuring that Baha'u'llah had the time needed to reveal his writings and meet with the pilgrims. And the second and very painful reason for this separation was that Abdul Baha's half-brothers, in particular Muhammad Ali, had grown jealous of Abdul Baha. They resented the reputation he had gained through his character qualities and acts of service to the poor and to his family and things that were noticed in the Akka community and they resented his sterling reputation and were envious of the great love that Baha'u'llah felt for his oldest son. And because of their jealousy and machinations, they caused great distress to Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l Baha, the Holy Family, and all the prisoners and exiled people with Baha'u'llah. And so by keeping Abdul Baha in the city with them, Abdul Baha could monitor their machinations and jealousy, and he could protect the community, the inner community of believers from them, as well as protecting Baha'u'llah from them. This is a great sacrifice on both their parts. This is a quote in Baha'u'llah's own words about his own reflections on the services rendered to him by Abdul Baha as recorded by Haji Mirza Haydar Ali. She says, in the days when we lived in Baghdad, we used to go to a coffee house where we would meet friends, strangers, and all sorts of people. This was the means by which the word of God could be heard and many souls were led into the cause. But in Adrianople and here in Akka, it is the master who performs these services. He must face the same hardships which we faced previously. In Baghdad, we were not imprisoned, and the fame of the cause was not even a hundredth part of what it is today. Also, the enemies of the cause were not as many or as powerful as they are now. In Adrianople, we met many people, but in the most great prison, we seldom receive visitors who are not believers. The burden of all these affairs has fallen upon the shoulders of the master. The master is another word for Abdul Baha. To provide us with some peace and comfort, he has made himself our shield, and thus he sees to our affairs, both with the government and the people. He first prepared for us the house at Masrae, and then he procured this mansion in Baji. He is so devoted to his services and so intensely occupied that sometimes weeks pass by and he cannot come here to visit us. While we consort with the friends and reveal tablets, he is immersed in the toils and troubles of the world. And there you see the mansion of Baji in the past and in the current that Abdul Baha worked tirelessly to provide for Baha'u'llah so he could enjoy the country and the greenery. As friends has talk about the children of the Abdul Baha, Abdul Baha had seven and three of them passed away uh, from four surviving daughters that he had was uh, Zia Khanum, Batul Khanum, and uh, uh, Ruha ba, and Tuba Khanum. Tuba described the one typical day 
that Abdul Baha had in his life in Akka. Tuba said, Abdul Baha rise early morning, have a cup of tea, and went out. Uh, Abdul Baha went to his self imposed labors of love. He went to help the poor people and the sick people. And then late in the afternoon, Abdul Baha, without eating any food or any rest, went to the Biruni. The Biruni was a large room that was located in front of their house, the other side of the street. Usually that room is reception room that who wants to visit Abdul Baha come there, who has some problem come. For example, uh, that day that uh, uh, Tuba Khan watching from the window from the house said a man came wanted by a shop, wanted advice. Another man came wanted a letter of recommendation for a job in government. A lady came and was telling that her husband was wrongly abused and they put in jail and her kids and herself, they're starving. They don't have anything to eat. And another lady complained that her brother and her husband beating her up. So Abdul Baha, in this situation, appointed a person that was really competent and sent with these poor people to a state the case to the judge at the courthouse so that they might have justice. The Biruni also received another group of people like uh, Mopti of Akov, governors, sheikhs, and officials, one by one or group together come. And when they come, they have a cup of coffee and then they converse together and then their problem, they speak to Abdul Baha and wanted from Abdul Baha advice. When they court rose, the judge came to the Biruni where he would speak of any complicated case. He was sure that Abdul Baha with wisdom, justice will help. Abdul Baha always bringing comfort to the oppressed, helping the judge to solve the problem. Some days he hardly saw his family. He usually visit Baha'is and sick people too. He took care of everybody, always neglect himself. He was very generous and in everything was, uh, had a lot of love for everybody. Arabs called him Lord of Generosity. In Akko, there was no hospital. So Abdul Baha hired a doctor. Name was Nikolaki Bey in Akko and put a salary for this doctor and asked him to take care of the poor people and don't tell that I gave you money and don't tell anybody about your payment. Many compassionate acts of love and charity master had that uh, it's a long, long story. The Mufti and Valley of the city of Akka, often coming and visit Abdul Baha, the, the news of the outside of Akka uh, to Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was going every week to Bahji and share about the outside accord with Baha'u'llah. O oh, thou omnipotent Lord, we are all held within the mighty grasp of thy power. Thou art our supporter and our helper. Grant us thy tender mercy. Bestow upon us thy bounty. Open the portals of grace and cast upon us the glance of thy favors. Let a vivifying breeze waft over us, and quicken thou our yearning hearts. Illumine our eyes, and make the sanctuary of our hearts the envy of every blossoming bower. Rejoice every soul, and gladden every spirit. Reveal thine ancient power, and make manifest thy great might. Cause the birds of human souls to soar to new heights, and let thy confidence in this nether world fathom the mysteries of thy kingdom. Set firm our steps and bestow upon us unwavering hearts. We are sinners, and thou art the ever forgiving. We are thy servants, and thou art the sovereign Lord. We are homeless wanderers, and thou art our haven and refuge. Graciously aid and assist us to diffuse thy sweet savors and to exalt thy word. 
elevate the station of the dispossessed and bestow thine inexhaustible treasure upon the destitute. Vouchsafe thy strength unto the weak and confer heavenly power upon the feeble. Thou art the provider, thou art the gracious, thou art the Lord who ruleth over all things. Abdul Raham. Mirza Mahmoudi Kashani has written eloquently of the great love and delight which Baha'u'llah expressed in the company of Abdul Baha. Many a time I was in the presence of Baha'u'llah when the Master was also present. Because of his presence, Baha'u'llah would be filled with the most joy and gladness. One could see his blessed countenance beaming with delight and exaltation so lovingly that no words can adequately describe it. Repeatedly, he would glorify the Master, and the mere mention of his name would suffice to evoke an indescribable feeling of ecstasy in the person of the blessed beauty. No pen is capable of fully describing this. Some years later, Mizar Ali Muhammad Varka, the distinguished poet, an apostle of Baha'u'llah, who would later attain the station of martyrdom in his cause, asked Baha'u'llah which member of his family would be the successor to whom he had alluded in the Kitab Yaqdas. Adib Tahirzadeh relates that in a tablet addressed to Varka, Baha'u'llah indicated that the intended person was the most great branch, and after him, the greater branch. But this disclosure was not shared with the Baha'i community. Haji Mirza Haydar Ali, another follower of Baha'u'llah, who suffered very greatly for his beliefs, presented to Baha'u'llah a commentary he had written, citing certain Islamic traditions which he understood to relate to Abdul Baha. Baha'u'llah praised his compilation, assuring Haji Mirza Haydar Ali that he was correct in his reasoning. He added, as the Haji recalled, the force of the utterance of the most great branch and his powers are not as yet fully revealed. In the future, it will be seen how he alone and unaided shall raise the banner of the most great name in the midmost heart of the world with power and authority and divine effulgence. It will be seen how he shall gather together the people of the earth under the tent of peace and concord. Hassan Balyuzi relates an incident from Tarazullah Samandari when Baha'u'llah administered to him a gentle, kindly, but highly significant admonition. For several days, he had not been called to the presence of Baha'u'llah, and encountering a small child of the household, he asked her to be the bearer of a petition for him to Baha'u'llah after ascertaining that he was alone. His petition was for the bounty of admission to his presence. When he attained it, Baha'u'llah asked him, Do you not meet the Master every day? Samandari's answer was affirmative, and Baha'u'llah said, Then why do you speak of not having been here in my presence for several days? You who meet the Master every day and receive the honor of his company. He equated meeting Abdul Baha with meeting himself. Another believer who made the pilgrimage in 1891 was Haji Mirza Habubulai Afnan. Adib Tahazadeh has summarized and translated the following extract from his memoirs in which he described a visit by Baha'u'llah and a number of pilgrims to the Junami Garden near Akka. 
His blessed person was extremely happy that day, and each one of the friends received his share of the bounties from his presence. We had lunch in the garden, then we assembled together and attained his presence. It was at that time that Abdul Baha arrived from Akka. The Blessed Beauty said, The Master is coming. Hasten to attend him. On those days, Baha'u'llah used to sow the seeds of loyalty and servitude toward him whom God had purposed, Abdul Baha, in the hearts of the believers and explained the lofty station and hidden reality of the Master to all. Attended by everyone, Abdul Baha came with great humility into the presence of the Blessed Beauty. Then the tongue of grandeur uttered words to this effect. From morning until now, this garden was not pleasant. But now, with the presence of the Master, it has become truly most delightful. Then, turning to the Master, he remarked, You should have come in the morning. Abdul Baha responded, The governor of Akka and some residents had requested to meet with me. Therefore, I had to receive and entertain them. Baha'u'llah, with a smiling face, said, The master is our shield. Everybody here lives in the utmost comfort and peace. Association with the outside people such as these is very, very difficult. It is the master who stands up to everything and prepares the means of comfort for all the friends. May God protect him from the evil of the envious and the hostile. Baha'u'llah was well aware that grievous tests and trials lay ahead for his successor. On another occasion, he revealed these words, By God, O people, mine eye weepeth, and the eye of Ali, the Bab, weepeth amongst the concourse on high. And mine heart crieth out, and the heart of Muhammad crieth out within the most glorious tabernacle. And my soul shouted, and the souls of the prophets shout before them that are endued with understanding. My sorrow is not for myself, but for him who shall come after me in the shadow of my cause with manifest and undoubted sovereignty. Inasmuch as they will not welcome his appearance, will repudiate his signs, will dispute his sovereignty, will contend with him, and will betray his cause.
Attendees are now invited to share stories and quotes. They can be from other years and other authors, but should help us better understand Abdu'l-Baha. This is an opportunity to practice telling a story from memory. Thank you. The love of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. I knew that after the passing of Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha went to Baha'u'llah's grave almost every day. And there's this very poignant picture of Abdu'l-Baha at his father's grave where you can see the depths of his sorrow for his longing and missing his father. But I did not know the flip side, or I hadn't remembered, to the depth of Baha'u'llah's love and that he was preparing the believers to embrace Abdu'l-Baha. It's not directly from the writings. It's a portrayal by the poet and writer Roger White, who's a wonderful Baha'i, in his little book called Another Song, Another Season. And it's a fictional account based on the actual account of Abdu Baha visiting the gravesite of Thornton Chase. Of Thornton Chase. Right. It captures the love of Abdu Baha, the tenderness of Abdu Baha in a very special way. It's a piece called Graveyards Are Not My Style. And that's a paraphrase of the, the attitude of the protagonist in this little story, who's a fictional character, but you'll see how it works. But it starts with this quote from Abdu'l Baha concerning Thornton Chase, who died in 1912, but before Abdu'l Baha could meet him. Abdu'l Baha said, This revered personage was the first Baha'i in America. His services will ever be remembered throughout future ages and cycles. For the present, his worth is not known, but in the future, it will be inestimably dear. The scenario is that this man is visiting with a friend, and this man is not a Baha'i, but he wants to marry a lovely Baha'i lady, and he's struggling with an understanding of her fervent attachment to this new religion called Baha. So he's at his friend's house to play cards and drink liquor. But he can't bring himself to drink liquor and he has to unburden his problems to his friend, Patty, who's sitting there with a longtime friend. And he says, well, Patty, I might as well come right out with it. I'm thinking of getting married to Lil. Not right away, but well, I plan to ask her. Well, but there is this problem of religion. Well, you must be sick of hearing about that, but what would people say? Me coming over to the new world like I did and getting mixed up in some queer religion? They might think of it as heathen. My poor old mother couldn't hold her head up in the village and the priest wouldn't take it lightly. And it's more than that. Uh, I, I think I'm jealous of Lil and I can't see why I'm not enough for her. Religion shouldn't come between people as I see it, but... Why isn't it enough that we just have each other? Well, but with Lil, religion's such an important matter. She's always trotting along to some meeting or another. The truth is, there being all kinds of people at these meetings, even Japanese. Not that I have anything against them, but what do you say to people like that? And I feel a proper fool sitting on their fancy chairs, my fingers feeling like buttered sausages, balancing a dainty teacup and little sandwiches, and all that talking that goes on, and me not understanding half of it. And why can't they have churches like everybody else? I say to Lil, and she always just says, just try to understand, as if I was working at not understanding. And then we have a fight, and it ends in strained talk. We finally make our peace. Well, anyway. So what happened is I picked up Lil at the shop to take her to a bit of an outing like we planned. But she asked me to take her to the graveside of one of her friends, a nice old fellow named Thornton Chase that I'd met and liked, who died just the end of last month and was laid to rest all the way out in Englewood. Well, you know me, Patty. 
I don't mind a good wake, but I don't like funerals, and graveyards are not my style at all. Well, that was part of it. But it turns out she wanted me to be there because of the master. That's the one she's always talking about with the name I can't pronounce. Well, I was actually a little bit jealous of her devotion to that religion and the master, and I felt tricked. And I knew there'd be a gathering with all Lil's friends and speeches and sermons and hymns, and we wouldn't have a minute alone. And she'd been to Chase's funeral just a few weeks before. So I had good, good reason in a way and kind of flew off the handle. Well, anyway, I ended up going for her. But the thing is, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Of course, I'm always more at ease out of doors to begin with, but it was more than that. I suppose I have to say it was the master. What a fine old gentleman he is. Oddly dressed to be sure and looking like a Bible figure in the Stations of the Cross. And yet so natural, as though you always knew him. So I didn't feel so out of place. The old gentleman walked to the grave with great dignity. And he laid some flowers on it. And he took Lil's flowers and the others and scattered them too and spoke a few simple words. Not the least unusual in a sense, but it was the way he leaned down to the ground with tenderness like a father bending to his dearest child to pat and comfort it. And I thought to myself that I would give my life to have him look at me that way. And he came all that way, came to the grave and said what he did, that Mr. Chase would never be forgotten. The old gentleman seems to expect great things of Lil and her friends. And no doubt they all well know it. I can't bear to think that they might disappoint him. If they broke his heart, they'd hear about it from me, I swear it, Patty, by all that's holy. And then the master turned, said a few words. I hung back not wanting to spoil it for Lil, but then the old gentleman did the strangest thing. He took her hand, as he had others, and then he reached for mine, and he just looked at us and said, Yes. You see, he was blessing our marriage, even though I'd never said anything. So on the way home, we were both lost in thought. I know I was. And suddenly, I was sobbing my heart out with Lil patting my hand and saying, it's all right, dearest, I know. <laughs> like I was a child. And that's just how I felt, to be sure. But I had been thinking of that look on the old gentleman's face when he was leaning toward the grave and wondering if ever I would be loved in that way by anyone. And so I said to Lil, I want this for you if you'll marry me, if this is what you want. I want you to be a good follower, the best you can. And I'd be proud if you were. And I don't know if I can be part of what you and your friends are doing, but I'll try to understand. All I can offer is this. I know that this is good. I know he is a holy soul. Well, my dear, says she with one of those smiles that melts a man heart. That's a beginning, a very fine beginning. So there's a little story about Thornton Chase. Thornton Chase was the first Baha'i. And whenever anybody came to town, this is in some Baha'is of the West, would come to town, they would talk. And one believer came to town. I don't remember who it is because I'm not that good with names. And they kept talking. So Thornton Chase said, I'll walk you to your hotel. So they walked to his hotel. They weren't done. And he said, well, I'll walk you to your hotel. And that's what they did the whole night. They walked back and forth between the two hotels because they could not stop talking and reveling in the fact that they had, that there were two believers that could share. And that's one of my favorite little stories. Um, yeah. 
what Abdul Baha began at Baji, the House of Justice finished in 2001. In 2001, for the very first time in history, the Baha'is were allowed to walk around the complete circumference of right. Baji. Right. And those that walked that day were those that attended the dedication of the terraces in May. This is a picture from the aerial oh, of the completed gardens. It's a mansion of Baji where um, Baha'u'llah is buried. The pathway around is complete. They walk all the way around. The very first time that they allowed anyone to walk around that, that complete circumference, except for the workers that were building it, was after the dedication of the terraces, when all of those Baha'is that had come from all over the world randomly selected among the community, not necessarily members of institutions, just a beautiful cross-section of Baha'is came and if you can imagine, when they started to walk around this path, they were walking three and four and five shoulder to shoulder, row after row after row. And when the first ones got all the way around to the beginning, there were still so many that it covered another third of the circumference. Wow. It was like there was Baha'u'llah in the middle and around his neck and over his shoulders was this incredible necklace of humanity. Mm. And every person was a jewel in that necklace, representing everybody that they had at home. It was it's, just overwhelmingly beautiful. I can somewhat relate to that. In 2007, Bill and I went on pilgrimage in November. And we were there for the ascension of Abdul Baha. You go into the room, it's open from, I think, 11 o'clock on for several hours before the program <coughs> begins at the time of his ascension. And you go and say prayers. And then, in absolute silence, the, all of the members that work at the World Center, led by the members of the House of Justice, all the pilgrims and all the guests, from the seat of the Universal House of Justice, in absolute silence, circumambulate the shrine of the Ba. It is one of the most powerful things I have ever done. And you've got like hundreds of people just walking in absolute silence. And the spiritual energy that is emanating all around us is palpable. I mean, to me, I felt like an earthquake under my feet. It was so special to be there for the ascension of Abdul Baha and to be where he ascended in the Holy Land. This reminds me of the account somewhere in Tahir Zadeh, and I can't put my hand on it quickly, where one of the early believers snuck out of Akka without permission to follow in the evening as Baha'u'llah went out of Akka to the mansion. And he and a friend of his snuck out behind the entourage and spread a little blanket or something and camped out within sight of the mansion. In the middle of the night, they were chanting odes and poems and prayers and meditating, probably very exhausted, but they couldn't quite understand why they were seeing and hearing a bit of a crowd of people somewhere near the mansion. And they saw some people walking around, sort of looked like they were sort of circumambulating the mansion. And um, they were amazed by it, and they couldn't quite figure out how, what all, how, who invited all those people. But anyway, they ended up exhausted, and they fell asleep. And the next day, they explained this, perhaps to the master. And yes. Baha'u'llah commented when this story came up. The comment was, you have managed to witness the circumambulation of the concourse on high around the blessed beauty in your whatever state you achieve through all your meditations and your prayers all night long. I got to believe in some sense that is always going on in association with the place we think of as Baji. At other levels, it's always going on other than the earthly level. We went through the entire of Memorials of the Faithful, which are the accounts from Abdu'l-Bahá of a little more than 60 early believers 
several of whom are famous and several of whom were completely obscure to us had Baha'u'llah not told their story. Some of them are only three paragraphs long, some go on for pages. One of the longer ones talks about, it's, what, it's my favorite story of all, it talks about one of the Afnan who is faithful to Baha'u'llah. And he was so dedicated to teaching and so spiritual that he had a famous teaching career all around the Middle East and he agreed to go to India to pioneer very, very early on. And he was particularly loved by Abdu'l Baha himself. And he passed away way out in India somewhere. But he was so beloved that Abdu'l Baha, through, through letters from Akka, orchestrated the return of his holy dust in a coffin all the way back to the Middle East. And that first, you say, well, this is hard to imagine, you know, in the late 1800s, that one of the Baha'is that was a renowned teacher, you know, and, and there's the Baha'i teachings about being within an hour of where you pass. And yet, in this instance, Abdu'l Baha is personally saying, his dust has to come back here. And the whole rest of the story is about this incredibly complicated, delicate dance that Abdu'l Baha was performing through correspondence and a few trusted believers all the way since India back to the Holy Land to have his coffin return to the Middle East such that it would not be exposed. They were looking for it. The authorities had heard about it. They were trying to find the coffin and desecrate it and get rid of this. Abdu'l Baha fooled them all. He even wrote letters to tell the believers to fake that they were taking the coffin to this city when in fact they quite quietly took it to a different city. All of this story comes back that the Afnan's dust finally was laid to rest at Abdu'l Baha's specific direction. He says in the story, I wrote many letters about it to trusted friends, in a place called Tesiphon, right next to the to the former palace of the great Sassanian kings of Persia. Yeah. And Abdu'l Baha concludes. What is the significance of the laying to rest of this Afnan's dust next to the, the former palace with its fallen arch? He said, the reason is, in the future, near his grave, this former arch of the kings must be turned into a mashrikal askar, and all of the dependencies will be erected there. I wrote many letters about how this must be done. But because of the return of the Afnan's dust to this place, the glory of the Persians of 2,300 years ago was redeemed. That's just a mind-blowing thing about the interaction between the physical dust and the influence it has on things far beyond our thought. But Abdul Baha knew it, and he orchestrated it. And he said, this was a gift to those Persians of more than 2,000 years ago, this grave next to this place. And that book is filled, as we went through all these little chapters, these little vignettes, filled with beautiful final phrases from Abdu Baha saying where, where each of these souls was buried. And it usually ends with something like, their holy dust is interred here. The shining light of their spirit is embedded here. So the physical conclusion of our life, depending on deeds, has a very powerful effect. Um, Janet Kahn wrote a book about being the descendants of the Dawnbreakers. It's a really excellent book. We're not descendants of the Dawnbreakers because we're special and we should pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> but we are because of what we're going to have to face mentally. Last year, we read the Dawnbreakers. They lived their lives as Dave described always, no matter what, feeling that embrace wrapped around them, no matter what they face, even if it was death. They never, ever dissuade from that embrace, being there, guiding them, no matter what. And I think that's the mantle that we need to wear to say, no matter what, Abdul Baha is always around us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of why we are to, you know, to, to seek Abdu'l-Baha, because 
he always, no matter what, was connected. And through him, we can feel that same divine connection. No matter how difficult things are, no matter how trying the world gets, just having that divine vision that the world has to go through this to get to the other side and nothing will hurt us if we keep that in our hearts and in our minds. That, that's kind of sort of where, where we need to be. And that's kind of sort of what Janet brings out in this book. It's, it's that, that we are in the best position and we will be confronting things that will cause us to feel that same way that the Dawnbreakers felt. And so that's what makes us the descendants of the Dawnbreakers. And I think it's a really important thing for us to remember because as the house says, things are gonna get harder. Things are gonna get more trying, you know, and, and we're human beings. And I've come to the conclusion that we're designed to do hard things. We just have to agree that we are designed to do them. <laughs> the unique nature of our relationship to Abdul Baha is that he is more approachable than Baha'u'llah. And yet, as we saw in part of the presentation tonight, where Baha'u'llah says, well, you see Abdul Baha every day, right? Yes. So why do you need to see me? The power of Abdul Baha is in that regard for us equivalent to the power of Baha'u'llah, but he's approachable in that regard. And so we're given that blessing of having a figure of that divine power that is yet approachable at our level. And so you could ask, well, why do we need such a thing? <laughs> and that gets to the point that you're making about the challenges that we are facing and will face in the future. The world has to undo a whole bunch of really silly, goofy, nasty stuff, and it's gonna take time. And we're really going to need to rely upon that guidance and that strength of Abdul Baha in particular. I remember an extended consultation over the relatively simple but amazingly deep quote, nothing save that which profiteth them can befall my loved ones. Nothing save that which profiteth them can befall my loved ones. The now, breakers understood that. Yeah. The challenge in that is we have to become his loved ones. It's not automatic. I think Abdul Baha was necessary because Baha was influence is for 500,000 years. You know, that's the longest influence that any manifestation will ever have. And he brings, it's, it's a pivotal time. It's a new language. It's opening the world to divine teachings. It's realizing that spiritual beings do this, not that. And that for 400 years, we were wrong. And for thousands of years, we were wrong. We interpret it wrong. And so out of God's love for us and out of God's knowing us, he gave us the gift of Abdul Baha who is the bridge to help us understand what we have to do, where we have to go, and how we have to do it. With Abdul Baha not in the picture, I don't think we would be able to figure any of this out. He is so necessary because there is no other example of how to be a Baha'i from the past. There is no other way to understand it from what has come before because Baha'u'llah has changed everything. And so the core of what becomes before brought us to where we are now, but we need Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah's writings to take us next, not going back. And so one of the issues in, in the world today is people are trying to go back <laughs> because they're not sure of going forward. So Abdu'l-Baha is the assurance that enables us to go forward. In Century of Light, it is stated that Abdu'l-Baha's secret of divine civilization, amongst some of the believers in Persia before the terrible persecutions hit, created a unique, coherent, 
spiritual society that has never been seen in the world before and was following Abdu'l-Baha's principles as expressed in the Secret of Divine Civilization. So he, at a young age, probably he was in his 30s or something like that, wrote that. His vision was well into the future. That's another book that I want to spend some time with because of the praise that has been heaped upon it by the House of Justice and Shoghi Effendi. One part of the story, which is very important to me, is the story of the relationship of Abdu'l-Bahá with his sister, the greatest holy leaf. Mm -hmm. If the greatest holy leaf had not stepped up to do her part, I don't know where the Baha'i world would be. Because when Abdu'l-Bahá was gone for those months, she was in charge, and she was a force to be reckoned with. And she was so mistreated because of her petite size, because she wore Western clothes, and because she was a woman. But nothing deterred her from doing what she needed to do. And she was not just a figurehead. She had full authority. And the covenant breakers came out in full force when Abdu'l-Bahá was not there. And she held her ground and kept the Baha'i world together. And then when the master passed away, her beloved brother, who she loved with all of her heart, and they felt connected even though they were separated, she sent letters of condolence to everybody and anybody who wrote to her. She's a really incredible woman. And she was the keeper of the archives. And if you went on pilgrimage during the time of the greatest holy leaf, you went into one of the rooms because, because the, the big part of the Shrine of the Bab wasn't there. It was just the foundation. She gathered all the pilgrims in one of the rooms and passed the artifacts. You got to touch the artifacts. And she shared with them the story of these artifacts as you touch them. Can you imagine touching the fez of Baha'u'llah mm -hmm. as the greatest holy leaf talked about it and, and the cape of Mullah Hussein. Mm -hmm. I mean, that blew me away when I read that. At some point, talking about their interaction, I think would be kind of fascinating. We found this quote that talks about the significance of the station of Abdu'l-Bahá. From the Guardian, where he says in, in his inimitable way, an attempt, I strongly feel, should be made to clarify our minds regarding the station occupied by Abdu Baha and the significance of his position in this holy dispensation. It would be indeed difficult for us who stand so close to such a tremendous figure and are drawn by the mysterious power of so magnetic a personality to obtain a clear and exact understanding of the role and character of one who, not only in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, but in the entire field of religious history, fulfills a unique function. He towers in conjunction with the Bab and Baha'u'llah above the destinies of this infant faith of God from a level to which no individual or body ministering to its needs after him, and for no less than a period of a full thousand years, can ever hope to rise. My favorite pop quiz for Baha'is. What's the most important thing about the 20th century? Remember, we had the famine, two world wars, all the horrors and, and wonders you can think of, blah, blah, blah. What do you think is the most important thing that happened? And the answer is, of course, nothing compares to the ministry of Abdu'l Baha. Because it will be referred to for so long in the future. Exactly. And it sets the stage for all that needs to unfold to unfold. Why did the Baha'i cross the road?
Cross the road to Pioneer to the other side of the road. <laughs>